All right, I think we're up to 90, so I'm going to get started. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, I think you all uh, know the ground rules. Uh, the panelists are the only ones who can show audio and video. Uh, the rest of you will be able to hear and will be able to see the speakers. The way you participate and ask questions is by using the Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen. Uh, so please try to use that rather than the chat. Um, and we will try to get to the questions um, in part. Um, so the agenda for this morning, um, quickly go over the uh, November Grand Round schedule. Uh, remind you that MEXAP reviews are still ongoing just before Grand Rounds. So these have also gone Zoom. And if you want to attend these, these are 7.30 a.m. on Thursdays. So we're gonna start today with a brief uh, COVID update. We haven't done that in a while. Epidemiology update by Dr. Lesho. Um, wanted to remind people about the open notes thing that's happening uh, next week. And there are several informational sessions about that. Uh, the first three of these are already done, 27th, 28th, and 29th of October. But you still have three sessions next week, November 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Uh, they are Zoom conferences and uh, sort of informational about uh, what the note sharing means and some tips about how to, how to approach that. Uh, when you know that patients are going to see your notes uh, almost as soon as they're signed. Uh, so very quickly, uh, the Grand Round schedule for next month. Uh, November 5th, we have our On Being a Physician uh, session. This was something that we did for the first time in, um, in 2017. And Dr. Wall, Gary Wall, was uh, one of the uh, participants. Um, and then last year, we decided that we would make this an annual thing. Um, and so as a tribute to Dr. Wall, uh, we have this session on being a physician. And so this year's session will be on November 5th. Uh, November 12th, uh, we have our GI uh, case conference being presented by Dr. Patrick of Colo. Uh, November 19th, we have a real CPC plan. Uh, and this will be done by Dr. Walid uh, Kuwatli. Uh, and then the 26th, of course, is, uh, is, grand, is Thanksgiving. So we only have uh, uh, three medical grand rounds presentations next month. Now, if there's a, uh, a COVID emergency and, and we need to have an additional uh, COVID presentation, then I will come on here one of these uh, sessions and, and use it to, uh, to present what we need to. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, remind you that if you um, want CME uh, credit for these, um, please fill out the evaluations and send them to Lisa. That's the only way you get uh, uh, credit for these. Um, also remind you that the sessions are being taped. Um, so a YouTube video of the Grand Rounds will be available uh, by this evening. Dr. Lesho, we're now up to 127 participants and you should be uh, presenting your screen. Here I go. Good morning, everybody. Can everybody uh, see that screen? Okay. All right. I want to thank uh, Dr. Patak and uh, Lisa Philipson for uh, allowing us to have a, a little bit of time here. I uh, also want to extend the thanks to the Infection Control and Infection Prevention Department because this is a very helpful venue for us to get important messages out. So thank you. So on the top there, we, you can see what we covered previously. Uh, as a teaser on the bottom future topics, we're going to try to tackle this conundrum of reinfection where patients retest after testing negative. Uh, we're gonna look at lessons learned over the last almost year and um, some other stuff. But today in pink, 
uh, honor of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We're going to be looking at PPE exposures, concerning trends, and um, registry updates. Alrighty, uh, let's go to the next slide. I have to take a moment out to implore everybody to get the flu vaccine. We're we're closing in on our goal to have almost 100% or, or thereabouts of our employees vaccinated. Uh, by by November, by early November, as of yesterday, we're at 62% of uh, the number of employees you see there. So it's pretty easy to get your flu shot. Don't forget to get it. Uh, I'm not going to um, harangue you guys with infection prevention HAI data, CLABSI CAUTI this time, but I have to take a moment to remind us all about how important it is to wear a mask. We want to create a culture of where, like uh, a mask and eye protection, has become almost part of the uniform. So consider yourself uh, as a as an unvolunteered draftee. And it was the virus that drafted all of us as uh, soldiers and sailors, and uh, just part of the uniform is a mask and uh, eye protection whenever you're whenever you're but mask at all times, eye protection when you're when you're dealing with patients. Also, visitors have to wear a face mask, especially when they leave their rooms and at all times. And we're gonna see why this is important. Don't forget about eye protection. You can have the goggles or face shields, but if you're doing any type of AGP on anybody, regardless of uh, COVID status, you should have a face shield to protect your mask a little better. Okay, uh, a, a message from Incident Command. Again, PPE saves lives. Uh, leaders, managers are empowered to hold us, uh, their employees accountable if they're seen not uh, complying. And, and we should feel comfortable asking others to follow the PPE policies as well. Why? Okay, so uh, I, I, I might be preaching to the choir somewhat, but um, we have, uh, you know, hopefully not an increasing trend of these events, but but we're seeing uh, a little bit more. So for example, last week, there were at least 16 uh, healthcare workers exposed uh, and a patient tested negative twice uh, during, his, during their admission process. And so therefore they were admitted to an overflow bed. And you, if you know about the ward layout, the overflow bed is, is fairly close to the nursing station, right? So there are those beds where you know six feet or less from, from the patient bed sits a row of nurses uh, on the monitors. And that patient had been there for a few days, had, uh, had been uh, ambulatory. Uh, depending on who you interviewed, uh, wear a mask most of the time, some of the time. Um, and again, depending on who was interviewed, there was suboptimal use of eye protection by the staff. And so uh, we, we've, we've got uh, great support from the lab in, in allowing expanded testing to the, the, the staff that had uh, uh, exposed, that had been uh, significantly exposed. Um, but, uh, but so uh, the importance of mask wearing is highlighted by that. A little bit worse in one of our other facilities, these were not exposures, let me point out. These were positive cases. So as of uh, a day or so ago, uh, there were 61 positive cases at this facility, all right? 50, about 50 residents and 15 staff. So if that's how many positive there were, the, the number of exposures based on the attack rates that we see, and unfortunately we've seen um, uh, a lower attack rate based on the number of exposures. Um, the, the, I, to my knowledge so far, the, 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 the highest attack rate was the exposure that we saw on our stroke ward. Uh, uh, but when you have that many cases, you have to realize at least, at least twice as many people were exposed. And so again, um, and then our IP team went there uh, right, you know, as the, as the outbreak was unfolding and immediately thereafter. And sadly, uh, they observed suboptimal compliance with the PPE among the staff. Now, not to blame everything on PPE, but it's critical, it's crucial. There are increasing background rates in that county. Uh, and these have been linked to weddings and worship services. And increasingly what we're seeing in the community is that it's not these mega events or the super spreader events that now kind of a pattern is smaller gatherings are being associated or impugned 
as uh, sources of these outbreaks. I want to point out that as the community incidence or prevalence, you know, the number of cases gets uh, back, unfortunately, begins to increase and it becomes more common. I want to take a, a second or two to remind us of, uh, uh, of the symptoms <clears throat> for COVID. Now, a lot of the uh, exposures and many outbreaks that we've seen were uh, had, a, had a commonality of PPE compliance or non-compliance. Um, there's not one trend where we, when we do root cause analysis that we say, ah, this, this is a common theme in every exposure and every outbreak. But um, the PPE uh, shows up fairly commonly. And another, uh, I wouldn't say commonly, but, but they stick out in our memory. This happened at least two or three times over the last month where I would say on the part of us, on the part of our clinicians, we had, we had an anchoring bias where a patient you know, had well, a well-known history, was a well-known patient of asthma or COPD or, uh, or, or GI symptoms. And the patient was uh, needed admission to the hospital but but all, you know all patients are tested upon admission, but the clinician can choose whether they're symptomatic or they're asymptomatic. And in those cases, it was chosen whether it was an oversight or not, or whether whether the clinician said, "Oh, this is definitely asthma. It's not shortness of breath due to COVID." When the test was ordered, when the admission test was ordered, it was clicked such that it was shunted to routine. There was a, a day or two delay. The patient had been admitted to a semi-private room. And that resulted in downstream exposures. And um, here uh, we had uh, initially had the opportunity to show this, that syncope, near syncope or non-mechanical falls in our early cohort of patients, over 100 patients was, uh, was in at least 24% uh, uh, of, the, of the first uh, 100 or so cases that we saw here at RGH. Syncope was the main uh, symptom. And you say, oh, well, uh, they probably also had uh, cardiovascular disease, volume depletion or whatever. That table down on, on the bottom shows you that no, the patients with COVID whose symptom was syncope were not significantly different based on those uh, cardiac or volume parameters. Uh, <clears throat> equally, if not probably more important than ordering uh, the right test in terms of, uh, of staff versus routine, is if you have some of these symptoms, we want symptom-driven isolation. So that's just important. And there is a reminder on some of the ordering panels that if you order a test, it will remind you and trigger and enhance isolation. So what's happening around the world? Not good news. A lot of these slides I'm gonna go over very fast because they're self-explanatory and they graphically depict what I really don't need to say. So over here, or the world. You see we're going up in the number of new cases. This is the United States over here on that side. <clears throat> and then, so let's take a look uh, at our state, what's happening here. So I tried to position our state and the surrounding states uh, like, like, like geographically. So up here, you can see this is New York, right? We're doing okay so far. Happily, we're doing okay in October 26, we had about 11, 1200 cases right over here. So we go down south to our neighbor in Pennsylvania, not good news. Look at this climb. We go out west over to our, our friends in Ohio. So we're surrounding by concerning trends right here. So let's go over to, now I put New York, where is New York? So now New York is over here on the left side of the screen here. And we go to our east, Connecticut, doing really good. But now look at this, October 26, 25th, look at these spikes. And then similarly, New Jersey on the uptrend. So, you know, no state, no man is an island. We have to worry about it. So you say, what's going on closer to home? Closer to home, New York City exceeded for the last two days its trigger alert of 550 new cases. Okay, right yet, not taking any drastic action yet, but that's the trend. Today, <clears throat> a report from the health department shows 61 new cases uh, in Monroe County. The seven day rolling daily average is the daily number of cases based on the seven day average is 61, just so happens to be. And the percent positivity, the daily positivity rate is 1.3. Last week, recently, it was above 2% for the first time since the early summer. It was 2.3%, but the seven-day average was 1.7%. We look at a nine-county Finger Lakes health region, and in that area, the seven-day percent positivity was 1%. We 
little even closer to home, if you were at Char Steakhouse in Strathallen on or about 17 October, you were asked to call the health department. There was a, a pay, there was a, stat, a worker there who tested positive and there was uh, exposures if you were at the bar uh, or standing in that area. Recently, yesterday and today, the county health department recommended that children two or more, two or more strongly recommended to wear masks. This is a breakdown by age uh, of, the, of the hospitalizations, the cases per 100,000 and the case fatality rate right there. And that's self-explanatory. And I'm gonna send these slides out to Lisa and you'll all get a copy of them. So I'm not gonna belabor it. What I look at this slide for is who, what age group is the most concerning. And so here you see that the 18 to 29 year old age group and the 50 to 64 year old, that's a yellow here and a light blue here, they comprise the greatest uh, proportion of new cases. So. Keep an eye on those, but, you know, it's particularly critical to watch those. I'm, I'm kind of worried about, about those age groups. You want a little more granularity as the pandemic unfolds. The, the county health department has now the ability to break it down, uh, stratify it by age adjusted rates, by race, gender, eth ethnicity, and sex. And I'm not gonna go through all this. I present it for your reference right here. You can, you can go, I know I've been asked about how, how different uh, racial or ethnic groups uh, compare to each other. You can see, see that here. Age adjusted rates per 100,000, again, broken down by, by race on this slide. Self-explanatory uh, for you can see there. And I'll just leave it up there for a second before we go on to the next one. So that's what's happening. Can we look into the future? What is the crystal ball telling us? Uh, Donna Newhart and her, and her team and Kalyana Kanaparthi do uh, the modeling and, and the next few slides are, are compliments uh, of there. Um, and they tell me that they're moving to a new refined model, a time series model. I don't understand all the math and all the stuff, but I think we can visually see where we were uh, and where we're starting to go right there. And this is presented all the time at the incident command. And the incident command and the, and the system has, has triggers, has surge triggers based on various parameters. And this is a projection here of what we might be able to expect based on the number of new cases in Monroe County, that's blue, and the RRH census, and that's yellow. And you see that it's a little bit hard to predict, uh, but that's what these, these dotted lines here, these are the 95% confidence intervals. So they're wide because uh, you know, it's still a little bit of uncertainty. But there's a little bit of good news in there. So early on in the pandemic, we saw that, uh, you know, for all the number of new cases, about, you know, 20% of those, around 20% required admission. What we're seeing early on right now in this, if you want to call it a second wave or a third wave or whatever, a leap uh, a little bit lower rates for hospitalization and ICU utilization. So right now, it's about 10% of people are positives that are that are requiring admission and lower rates requiring ventilators and ICU admission. Finally, we're going to talk about the registry. This was begun by uh, uh, very talented residents, medical residents, uh, Hannah Chen now with uh, Portalis and, and, and Mina, uh, also supported by Incident Command and Quality Safety. And if you see, saw the recent uh, editorials in the New England Journal of Medicine, tragic data gap or dying in a leadership vacuum that provided a lot of motivation. Uh, for this project. And what we, what we sought to create was an adaptive living registry with every patient in the system uh, and, and a granular uh, one at that, 75 more parameters, epidemiological lab imaging. We didn't know what we were doing initially. We didn't know about the, the, the thing called, we knew about REDCap, but we didn't realize that if you're at RGH or in the system at RRH, you, you can get access to REDCap. It doesn't cost anything. And so uh, we started out in Excel, then we were moving it to REDCap. <clears throat> and we're also utilizing the case report form that's standardized with the CDC from the National Center for uh, Infectious Disease and Respiratory Disease. Here's where it is. We're trying to keep it, we call it a living adaptive registry, but right now it's on life support. And that's why I'm, I'm reaching out uh, for its labor intensive. So far, there have been 3,300 patients uh, uh, you know, uh, captured by, by lab testing. 
we've only been able to get about 15% fully entered in, into, the, into the registry. It's labor intense. If you break it down, it requires two full FTEs all the time. We need automation, we need machine learning, uh, and we're, we're looking at, uh, we have a, a list of lessons learned. So if you're interested in helping out, we'll get you on that protocol. It's an easy exemption protocol. The benefit to, to, to you guys would be, and, and some are already leveraging it. If you help build it, you'll be very familiar with it. It'll be available to you for hypothesis. And so we had the ability, again, <clears throat> the, 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 the statistics team, uh, was able to help us out look at the mortality analysis. And this is kind of before remdesivir and mostly before we knew about steroids. This is, remember, only about the first 400 patients. So we got 400 patients probably by the, by the end of April. I think April 11th was the cutoff here. You see about these were the things that were associated or not associated with mortality. And so you say, well, why? This is all published or this is, this is available. I mean, this isn't published, but other teams have published. So what's the significance? What's the benefit of having this registry? Well, it provides modeling input for more accurate, more tailored predictions for surge planning here. It's already been uh, somewhat helpful to, to Donna Newhart and the team uh, looking at those modelings. And what we found was that there are important differences because our populations are not the same as other populations, right? They're a little bit different. Maybe there's something different from uh, China, maybe in New York City or somebody. So for example, we found that the, the viral load, if you will, or the, or the cycle threshold did not correlate with the severity. The, the, the cycle threshold from your initial diagnostic test, it didn't, it didn't comport with whether or not you were gonna need ICU care, whether you died or whatever. That was not the case in New York City. I'm not published in infectious disease, New York City experience. Another example, ACEs and ARBs were, are higher. Uh, uh, we're high, you know, we have found discordant results. In the interest of time, we found discordant results between ACEs and ARBs based on other researchers. Uh, here's a one, length of stay without remdesivir was already shorter in this, in this cohort than the 15 day main outcome. Uh, measure that was used in the final NEGM report on the Desiger report. And in, Ch in China, from a paper from Cell Biology, statins were associated with in-house, in-hospital use of statins was associated with improved mortality. That's not what we found. We found that our patients were using statins, uh, it was, if it was part of their outpatient prescriptions, they were associated with a, a need for admission compared to those who were treated and released, and it was more associated. Finally, we can link it to the genomes. We're increasingly trying to sequence, do whole genome sequencing on the viral genomes. And when you link, when you, when you have a group of, uh, of, of, of clinical and epidemiologic data that you can link to a whole genome, it becomes very powerful for precision epidemiology. A reminder, a reminder of that we're gonna be decorating for the seasons and we found COVID uh, RNA uh, on a lot of different services, more so think about it when you're putting those decorations up. It's already in the setting of uh, EBS being short-staffed. Uh, and, and then just another practical reminder, uh, we, sur we, we surveyed about 400 surfaces, uh, for those of you that didn't see that presentation. A, a, a common surface that was, you, that, you know, that was frequently contaminated were shared surfaces, so be careful. Wash your hands, especially blue cometers vital signs machine, so those traveling, shared pieces of equipment. Finally, uh, Halloween, Day of the Dead, Thanksgiving coming up, I encourage you to look at this uh, link here from the CDC, offer safe Halloweening tips, et cetera. Okay, thanks everybody, I hope I didn't go over too far. And I will stop sharing. Uh, oh, sure. In the interest of time, I'm, I'm gonna let them go ahead with the case. And Dr. Lesho, if you can, answer. There's one or two questions um, on the text. You can just answer them by text. So okay. Dr. Tizhani, if you want to go ahead with your... So Dr. Lesho, stop presenting and... Yep. All right. All right. I think everybody can see my presentation, right, Dr. Fadok? Yes. All right. Perfect. Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Ekta Tirtani. I'm one of the second year residents in internal medicine. And today, uh, Dr. Q and I are gonna be presenting endocrinopathy related to immune checkpoint inhibitors. Now, this is a well-documented um, 
you know, one of the manifestations and side effects of immune checkpoint inhibitors. But, you know, for my love of endocrinology and oncology, I wanted to combine a topic that would be relevant to both. I just wanted to say a special thank you to Dr. Chavez for sharing one of his cases uh, and Dr. Fanan Man, who's been very kind and uh, is going to be a panelist today. All right, so we'll start with the first case. Um, I have a 56 year old man, let me try and get this one. 56 year old man with a history of malignant melanoma who comes to the ED in Feb 2020 with the following complaints in six days. Dry mouth, excessive thirst, excessive urination, fatigue, and vomiting. So the patient denied any fever, chills, dysuria, cough, abdominal pain, shortness of breath, diarrhea, runny nose, or sore throat. So no particular infectious trigger for these symptoms. The patient denied any history of diabetes. However, his father was diabetic. His medications include Eliquis, Emtricidabine tenofovir for HIV prophylaxis, Ramipril, Metoprolol for hypertension. Interestingly, he had a family history of melanoma in his brother and his mom, but he denied any alcohol use, recreational drug use, or tobacco use. Now let's move on to the most interesting part. So his oncology history. He had BRAF negative stage one cutaneous melanoma of his right flank status post excision in 2012. However, unfortunately, in 2019, he developed right-sided, so upper chest wall mass, most consistent with in-transit metastasis. He had complete excision of the soft tissue chest wall mass, and it was consistent with malignant melanoma, and right axillary lymph node dissection was done. The patient was started on nivolumab adjuvant therapy uh, with the first dose given at the end of January. So let's recap here. The patient comes in late February, and his first dose of nivolumab was in January 2020. So physical exam-wise, um, it was pretty unremarkable except for the tachycardia and the dry mucous membranes. On labs, as we see here, pretty stark, and you know, if you can see the blood glucose, he came in with three, 860 blood glucose, um, pseudo-hyponatremia, 124 sodium, um, and bicarbonate was less than 10, and iron gap non-calculable. Triglycerides, 606, total cholesterol, 222, pH of 7.01, largely contributed by an elevated beta-hydroxybutrate level. And um, interestingly, his HbA1c, which is technically a marker of the past three months, but uh, he, he had it elevated at 7.9. So which means the, probably the disease process had begun immediately after um, administration of the nivolumab. So our impression was new type one diabetes, which presented with DKA and hypertriglyceridemia due to a single dose of nivolumab used a month prior for malignant melanoma. The DKA was appropriately treated with insulin drip followed by the subcutaneous DKA protocol once the gap closed. And the patient was discharged on 45 units of Lantus along with the low-dose sliding scale insulin, which was obviously a new medication for him. Interestingly, in a few months, however, his Glantis dose was bumped up to 65 units, projecting a picture of complete uh, pancreatic beta cell destruction because of the autoimmune factors related to nivolumab therapy. So oncology recommended starting nivolumab again uh, because the patient had a re reoccurrence of the melanoma, but he was able to tolerate the second cycle. Um, he was already insulin dependent at that time. In June 2020, he had widespread metastasis on the PET scan, and he was given appropriate treatment with pembrolizumab plus aplilumab therapy because the patient had recurrence after being on nivolumab. So another case that I wanted to share was of a 70-year-old gentleman with metastatic adenocarcinoma of the left lung who presented to the endocrine office with worsening fatigue uh, since the past four months and weight loss about 14 pounds in the past three months. He denied any tremors, anxiety, um, increased bowel movements, increased appetite, heat intolerance, sweating, dysphagia, dyspnea, neck swelling or mass, pain or tenderness. Now, moving on to his oncology history, 
He was diagnosed with stage four adenocarcinoma of the left lung with malignant pleural effusion, status post VATS with pleurodesis and metastasis in Feb, March, 2020. And when they did the GARDEN 360 testing to look for any targetable mutations as we commonly do these days, um, he had a PDL1 expression of 5%. The patient was started on palliative chemotherapy with carboplatin, pemetrexate, and pembrolizumab. And at the time that he actually presented in the endocrine office, he had finished five cycles of this therapy. So I have a very interesting um, graph and you know some lab values here that we can go over. So as you notice, the last time that his um, thyroid function was essentially normal was sometime in May. And as we see here, slowly the TSH coming down, okay, to the point that it's less than 0 0.01, which is not reported. And, you know, appropriately, the T4 is going up. So the patient initially begins with the thyrotoxic phase of the immune thyroid dysfunction that we're seeing. So he first presented to the endocrine office in June of 2020 after his five cycles of chemotherapy. And we did anti-TPO antibody testing as well as TAB antibody testing. So in, now this is really interesting because one would feel this would be a picture of you know, antibodies causing destruction. But as you learn from Dr. Quattricio's slides going ahead, it's antibodies are, are generated as um, a product of T cell mediated destruction of the thyroid gland and they just serve as a marker and not as a, a causative theory which causes the hyperthyroidism. So when we move to um, July, we see the patient has had seven cycles of chemotherapy now, but is still asymptomatic. And interesting to note, around August at this time, we're seeing an improvement in the TSH numbers and an improvement in the free T4 numbers. And then right after that, a complete reversal of picture. We have a decreased T4 and um, the TSH levels are starting to rise. So we're moving into what we call the hypothyroid phase of the thyroid dysfunction. So in September, uh, the patient actually had symptoms. He started to feel fatigued and he was put on 50 microgram of levothyroxine. So that's around this point right here when the TSH peaked out at 96. And then in October, the patient had, had completed 11 cycles. He felt less fatigued. He had gained about 13 pounds, which is very different from the presentation that he came in with. And we continued him on the same dose of levothyroxine because we were seeing some improvement in numbers. So the impression for this case was pembrolizumab induced thyroid dysfunction which mimics the clinical course of silent thyroiditis. So if you look at the graph here, you know, we started off at, if you just, you know, look at this pink line here, we started off with TSH levels pretty much normal. And then we slowly see that it's not even been reported here because the patient's in what we call a thyrotoxic phase where they're releasing a lot of thyroid hormone. And then slowly it's complete dramatic reversal into hypothyroidism where the TSH peaked out. Now, if we compare to this to you know, the natural history of a patient with subacute thyroiditis, you see a very similar picture. If you look at this uh, yellow line here, uh, we go you know, somewhere in this thyrotoxic phase, slowly move into a hypothyroid phase. A lot of patients go back to being euthyroid, but some patients develop permanent hypothyroidism, which is the case of our patient. So the important questions to ask at this point are, what is the pathophysiology of endocrinopathy related to immune checkpoint inhibitors? What are the different manifestations of the disease? What are the treatment options available? And what are the guidelines regarding monitoring endocrine markers while being on immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy? So I'll turn over to Dr. Q, who's going to um, give his presentation and um, you know, help us learn more about um, endocrinopathy related to immune checkpoint inhibitors. All right, everyone. So thank you for having me today. Let me see if I can pull my screen over here so I can actually talk and present at the same time. 
All right, so thanks everyone for having me today. Um, I'm Dr. Michael Portuccio. Um, I'm from the endocrinology department here at um, RGH out at Alex Park, and I'm gonna be talking about the MIN checkpoint inhibitors and the endocrine system. Um, so objectives today, we're gonna to understand the basics of how immune checkpoint inhibitors work. Um, we're gonna talk about the endocrinopathies commonly associated with their use, um, understanding how to screen and diagnose these endocrinopathies and the basic treatment um, surrounding these um, endocrinopathies related to the ICIs. So <laughs> how ICIs work, I don't relish being an endocrinologist um, and addressing that immunology topic that made everyone cringe during medical school. So just a warning, I'm an endocrinologist. This is a very simplified version. Um, so please just be patient with me. Um, but in, in review, um, T cell activation um, and, and function is controlled through a really tight balance of stimulatory and inhibitory signals. Um, obviously, the critical step is presentation of antigens to these T cell receptors. But it's not just as simple as showing that antigen and the T cell is activated. There's really important co-stimulatory signals and cytokines that are needed for activation or inhibition. And there's that fine balance between activating and attacking the response um, versus um, um, having a, um, a suppression of the immune system so you don't attack self. So inhibitory symptom, uh, signals are needed to prevent that chronic activation and to prevent autoimmune diseases. So when we look at a, a fairly simplified schematic, you can see on the left, we have the antigen presenting cell. On the right, we have our T cell. Um, and the important um, co-activator, so you have your, your MCH, which is presenting antigen to the T-cell receptor. And then if you have this co-stimulatory signal, it's going to lead to increased transcription, increased survival, so activation of these T-cells if you have that co-stimulatory signal. Oh. And of course, that uh, had an error there. So of course, the animations never work the way you want them to, but... Um, the same slide is going to show if you have a suppressor signal, so CTLA-4 or PD-1 that's, um, that's connected, instead of the activating signal, you actually um, have suppression of the T cell. And we're going to get into those a little bit more. So again, if you're activating CD-28, it's going to lead to stimulation. If you're activating CTLA-4 or PD-1, it's going to cause suppression of the T cell activation. Oh, and there we go. Sorry about that. So now they, they pop back up. So again, um, if you have the, the inhibitory signals that are there, it's basically going to, it's going to squash the T-cell response. So what's the difference between the CTLA-4 and the PD-1? Um, CTLA-4 um, really, um, it, it, it's going to inhibit IL, uh, IL-2 release. It's going to suppress uh, T-cell activation. So it's going to prevent priming of naive T-cells, okay? So most of this is happening in the lymphoid compartment. These are gonna be the compartments draining that tumor. So they're presenting antigens from the tumor. And if you have the CTLA-4, it's going to prevent activation of those T cells. Versus PD-1, that's the inhibitory factor that's really more associated with T cell exhaustion and programmed T cell death. This is suppression of already um, differentiated effectors. Those T cells are out there. This is basically calming them down versus CTLA-4, which is causing activation of naive T cells. The PD-1 really has most of its effect in the tumor microenvironment. So not in the lymphoid tissue, but actually where the tumor um, is having its effect in the body. Um, PD-1, so again, the suppressing factor is upregulated in states of chronic, um, uh, chronic inflammation and prolonged antigen exposure. So it's a natural response for the bodily body to try to downregulate the T cell response when you have this chronic inflammation. All right, so the role in cancers. Um, so tumor cells use these inhibitory signals to kind of co-op, they co-op these signals to avoid detection, to avoid rejection, to, uh, to avoid being destroyed. Um, they know that the, um, the ligand for PD-1, um, PD-1L is overexpressed in many different solid tumors and the PD-2L, the ligand that um, um, stimulates, uh, stimulated by PD-1 um, is gonna be overexpressed in mainly hematologic cancer cells. So if you block the inhibitory factor, so if these tumors are blocking the, um, sorry, if, if you're, so if you're blocking the inhibitory factors that the tumors are blocking, you can actually reactivate that immune cell response. So this works, these, these have been out maybe about 10 years or so. I think the first was improved in 2013, don't quote me on that. But you're basically using, um, using these medications to prevent the inhibition that's created by these tumor cells and reactivate the immune system. 
So on the left-hand side, you can see if you have um, the antigen-presenting cell with the CTLA-4 um, engaged, it's going to lead to the inactive T cell. Um, but on the right, you can see that you have the anti-CTLA-4 um, antibody that's blocking CTLA-4, and that actually leads to the activated, um, activated T cell. So basically, these medications are just restoring that immune response that the cancer cells are trying to fool. And the same thing is going to be happening in the periphery, actually, in the tumor microenvironment. Again, those, those T cells are inhibited mainly by PD-1. And if you have the anti-PD-1 itself, or if you block the ligand, you're going to, again, um, prevent T cell exhaustion and keep these T cells active and fighting. So the currently approved immune checkpoint inhibitors are listed right here. Um, I believe most here probably have the most experience with Yervoy, Opdivo, and Keytruda. So um, ipilimumab or Yervoy is your um, CTLA-4 inhibitor, whereas Opdivo and um, Keytruda are your PD-1 inhibitors. Um, the PDL ones, um, the ligand inhibitors, are also out there. I've seen them used a little bit less, but you're going to be seeing them used more and more. And as of earlier this year, they are approved for various kinds of cancers. Most of these started off with a, uh, with a melanoma approval, and then since then have really been expanded quite rapidly. Um, this is probably out of date. There, there's constantly approvals for new cancer types, and particularly combination therapy. So if you have your CTL, uh, CTLA-4 plus a PD-1 inhibitor or a ligand inhibitor, they really are quite effective um, when they're used in combination. So what could go wrong? Um, Obviously, you're going to, if you're reactivating the immune system, you're expecting some immune-related adverse effects. Um, when you're reactivating these T cells, they are not tumor-specific. Uh, hopefully, in the future, there, there's a way that that, could be, um, that that could be addressed. But right now, they're, they're not, uh, not tumor-specific, so you can have an immune response against self-antigen. And this can lead to either autoimmune or inflammatory responses. GI tract, skin, and liver manifestations are extremely common. Obviously, they're not going to be the focus of my uh, talk today, but they're going to be much more common than your endocrinopathies, but the endocrine system is also commonly affected. Um, the frequency of these um, the immune-related effects um, happens more, obviously, with combination therapy. In general, not endocrine-specific, the CTL, uh, CTLA-4 inhibitors um, have a higher incidence of adverse effects than do the PD-1 and the PD-1 ligand, but for endocrine, that, that's flipped around a little bit, but obviously combination therapy is when you'd expect to see the highest incidence of any of these adverse effects. Um, the timing, again, don't take this as gospel because this is ever evolving, but the dermatological effects generally happen pretty quickly within two to three weeks. GI effects a little bit later, um, usually around six weeks. Endocrine, typically around seven weeks or a little bit later on, but obviously there is a little bit of wiggle room here, but that's just in generalities. So the main um, endocrine um, adverse effects we need to be aware of is hypophysitis, um, thyrotoxicosis, hypothyroidism, then also type 1 diabetes and adrenalitis. And um, obviously the um, a shared factor between the hypophysitis and adrenalitis obviously would be adrenal insufficiency resulting from both. Um, the biggest study we have of endocrine-related adverse effects comes from a, um, systematic, a systematic review and meta-analysis of about 7,500 patients that are on immune checkpoint inhibitors for a variety of cancers. Um, this is the best we have. It's not perfect. Not every study reported every endocrine um, adverse effect. Um, they also, they use a variety of therapies from combination to single agent. So obviously, this isn't perfect. This is going to be evolving as time goes on. So probably one of the most concerning endocrine adverse effects would be hypophysitis, which is just a fancy word for pituitary inflammation. Just as a you know, history of medicine, hypophysis is a technical term for the pituitary from your ancient Greek uh, meaning attached underneath, because if you were to pull out the brain, it looks like the pituitary is just attached underneath the brain. So this is any kind of inflammation of the pituitary or the pituitary stalk. Um, CTLA-4 is found on normal pituitary cells, so this might explain that you have an increased frequency of pituitary inflammation with your CTLA-4 inhibitors. Again, that would be your Yervoy. So the presentation that we look for, and, and most of this is going to stem from um, adrenal insufficiency or um, hypothyroidism. So headache is going to be one. Obviously, if you're having inflammation inside the brain, you're going to get headache, but then fatigue, nausea, weakness. Again, we're looking at uh, adrenal insufficiency and hypothyroidism as the main triggers of these. Visual symptoms can occur, you know, the classic, if you have um, enlargement of the pituitary, your bitemporal hemianopsis, it can happen, but not super common because you generally don't see huge inflammation of the pituitary that's extending up to the optic chiasm. 
It's possible, but again, not super common. So the lack of visual symptoms should not um, discourage you from making this diagnosis. Any pituitary axis can be affected. Obviously, you want to be thinking about what's going to hurt the patient the most quickly, and that's going to be your adrenal axis, your thyroid axis, but also your, um, uh, your diabetes insipidus, your, your vasopressin axis as well, because that can really um, play with the electrolytes very easily, especially with someone that doesn't have free access to water. When you're looking at this, your differential diagnosis, you shouldn't just assume this is hypothesitis. You have to be looking for brain metastases as well, because you can easily have metastases to the pituitary that can masquerade as this as well. So for diagnosis, the MRI is really going to be your diagnostic tool of choice. Um, you, you can see an enlarged pituitary. You can see more stalk enhancement, or it can be perfectly normal. Basically, the MRI is looking for that metastasis. And if you don't see the metastasis and they have signs that are symptoms um, uh, consistent with this, you can, you can pretty well call it hypophysitis. You don't need to have abnormalities to call it hypophysitis. Lab-wise, if you're expecting this, you need to get an AM cortisol or an, a, and or an ACTH level, and I would say both. Um, you're also going to want to get thyroid studies. Important to get both a TSH and a free T4. Do not get the TSH with the reflex to free T4 because if you have central hypothyroidism, you can have a normal TSH and then an inappropriately low free T4. So it's really important in this case, order both the TSH and the free T4 as separate orders. Um, you can get sex hormones if you want to, um, you know, looking at your, your testosterone for men, estradiol for women. In the acute setting, don't waste your time. If they're acutely ill, they're not really interpretable anyway. That's really gonna be more of a long-term management. Um, treatment, generally you're going to use high-dose steroids, which is going to cover your inflammation as well as any kind of potential adrenal crisis. One, um, uh, one recommended regimen is one mg per kg per day of prednisone, though you can use DEX if you want to, you can use hydrocortisone. There's probably no substantial difference there in the acute setting. Thyroid replacement, when you give them back levothyroxine, you have to base this off of free T4 and not TSH, and I cannot stress that enough. A lot of times in these cases, after I make the initial diagnosis, sometimes I'll urge people don't even check the TSH because it's really easy to make a mistake and treat this as any other kind of hypothyroidism. But again, you obviously would treat central hypothyroidism a little bit differently. If they have diabetes insipidus, you can use desmopressin. Generally, if, as long as someone's thirst mechanism is attacked, uh, is intact <coughs> and they have access to free water, they'll maintain their hydration. But with these patients, it's difficult. They might have impaired cognition. They might not be able to maintain their free water intake. So desmopressin, it'll help them symptomatically. They'll be your friends so they can actually sleep at night. Um, but for people who have impaired um, uh, cognition, it's, it's even more important to maintain that electrolyte balance. Um, sex hormone replacement, again, down the line, it's really not needed acutely, but you don't want to completely ignore it because if someone's hypogonadal, obviously it can lead to, it can lead to bad bone effects going forward. Um, prognosis, you can have recovery of some of these axes, but not always. It's really um, variable, and the more and more data is going to be needed to see um, how many people actually do recover. So if you look at the incidence of hypophysitis, they have the percent incidence um, is your um, y-axis, and they have your different immune checkpoint inhibitors on your, on your X. Um, you can see combination therapy obviously has the highest incidence, up to 8% of people on combination therapy can develop hypophysitis. CTLA-4 inhibitors cause it a little bit more, just shy of 4%, and then less commonly in your PD-1 and PD-1 um, ligand inhibitors. Thyrotoxicosis. So um, I'm sure anyone who's worked with me um, knows my rant about the difference between hyperthyroidism and thyrotoxicosis, and it seems arbitrary, but I want to get rid of the, um, the interpretation that thyrotoxicosis means that you are toxic. It has nothing to do with that. It basically just means excess thyroid hormone from an unknown etiology. Hyperthyroidism means that the excess thyroid hormone is coming from gland overproduction. So Graves' disease is hyperthyroidism. A destructive thyroiditis, your gland's not producing any more hormone, hormone it's just releasing preformed hormone. Technically, um, that, that gland destruction is thyrotoxicosis, not hyperthyroidism. Trivial, you might say, but it is imp an important difference. So the thyrotoxicosis can result from just a silent thyroiditis, so you have transient inflammation of the gland, you release preformed thyroid hormone, or it can be from Graves' disease. It's probably more common that the silent thyroiditis is happening, more so than Graves, but Graves' disease is possible. If these folks are presenting with proptosis, be aware of that, and you really want to be thinking about Graves' disease as a possible explanation. It's really unclear if pre-existing um, thyroid antibodies increase the risk of this. Some studies show that they do. Some studies uh, show that they don't, so we're really not sure. 
So diagnosis, I definitely would want to check TSH, 3, T4, and total T3. Sometimes you'll have an isolated elevation of total T3 and not 3, T4. So it really is important to check all three. Um, a CSI, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, will help you diagnose Graves' disease. So I usually do recommend checking that. The nuclear medicine um, uptake and scan may be helpful, but you have to be really careful. If someone recently got a contrast load, you're going to get a falsely low iodine uptake because that, that contrast is going, to, uh, inhib is going to compete with what you're giving with the radio iodine. So these are cancer patients. A lot of them really have had a high contrast load. So the nuclear medicine uptake and scan oftentimes is a little bit less useful. But if they haven't had recent iodine, you can try. But the TSI is pretty durable. You can check that. Um, treatment, if it's silent thyroiditis and they don't look like they have Graves' disease, it's really just supportive care. You're giving them beta blockers. If it's really severe, you can use glucocorticoids, but a lot of times if you just beta block them with non-selective beta blockers, they do fine. If it's Graves, obviously you want to use the supportive care, but then they're going to need something else. If they are very, very sick, sometimes we will send them to surgery. Um, radioactive iodine will take at least months to have full effects, so be aware if they're really sick in the short term, radioactive iodine is going to take some time. Oftentimes, we'll use methimazole. In the, like it was a thyroid storm situation, obviously, we would use, you could use steroids and various other things, but if they're, if they're not as sick, methimazole is often what we'll jump to until things calm down. Um, so the incidence of hyperthyroidism, again, this is not distinguished between a silent thyroiditis and Graves. Obviously, it's more common in combination therapy. Um, so you'll see about 8% in combination therapy um, have this. And then you can see kind of a flip. Um, it's a little bit less common with the CTLA-4 inhibitors alone, a little bit more common with your PD-1 inhibitors. Hypo hypothyroidism can be central, like from hypophysitis. It can be primary, so your Hashimoto's, your gland, gland destruction, or it can be a sequela of post-silent thyroiditis. Um, I was talking to Ecta about this before. So, so what's the difference between Hashimoto and then just persistent gland destruction after a silent thyroiditis? There's tons of debate about this. If you want to be by the books, Hashimoto's is really chronic autoimmune destruction. There's a variant where you can get a little bit thyrotoxic in the beginning and then slowly have a decline, but usually it's just a slow decline in thyroid function without the thyrotoxicosis in the beginning. If it's a really frank thyrotoxicosis and then a slump hypothyroid, it's really more consistent with a silent thyroiditis that destroyed enough of the gland acutely that it's just not able to recover. Um, it's kind of arbitrary. It's probably something similar. Um, a lot of folks with the, the, the silent thyroiditis also have TPO antibodies, but I, I think of them as a little bit differently. Hashimoto's usually is just that progressive decline without the hyperthyroid at the beginning of the whole phase, but uh, the, the hypothyroidism can occur from any of these. So obviously you're going to want to check a TSH and a free T4. Again, you're checking both because if this is central, you need to have both to make that diagnosis. TPO antibody, like I said, can be helpful, not really necessary. And then you're going to treat with people thyroxine. This, this isn't rocket science as far as that's concerned. But if it's central, you have to base it off the free T4. And we usually try to get that free T4 sometime, somewhere in the upper one half of the normal range. Some people will say the upper one third. Um, hypothyroidism is a lot more common. Um, in combination therapy, about 13% of people will develop hypothyroidism, and again, 7% in with the PD-1s, and about a little shy of 4% with the other agents. Type 1 diabetes obviously can, uh, can happen with this. Um, PD-1 has been um, is expressed on pancreatic islet cells, so obviously this can happen. A little bit of a smaller incidence. This is, this is something that's uh, newer um, and is more common with your PD-1 inhibitor agents. Obviously, DKA can be the, easily be the presentation. You're going to want to check your anion gap, ketone, C-peptide. Um, a GAD antibody is usually really helpful in an islet antibody. A1C can be normal-ish, okay? A1C is a three-month marker. It's more influenced by the last month of glucoses, but, you know, you could say, like, well, that person's coming in with it. Their A1C was only 7.8%. Why are they coming in with DKA? Because they got hyperglycemic really, really quickly. Um, obviously, if they're coming in with DKA, you're going to want to use insulin, um, IV insulin. But with these folks, assume it's autoimmune diabetes and treat them with insulin. We can figure it out as an outpatient. This is not the, not the person to be experimenting with oral therapies. And just be really careful. These folks, even if they're coming in really frankly hyperglycemic, they can be exquisitely sensitive to insulin, um, just like a normal type 1. So don't give them you know, 30 units of Lantus off the bat because you can really send them hypoglycemic pretty quickly. Um, we really not, don't have time to go over the specifics of this, but those are just some more um, about the cases of type 1 diabetes. Obviously, adrenalitis or Addison's disease can happen a little bit less com more com uh, sorry, a little bit less commonly than the hypophysitis, but you can have direct gland destruction. Um, you're going to have an elevated ACTH in this case, again, because your gland is being destroyed. 
keep in mind, these folks need both glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids, as opposed to the hypophysitis that just need the glucocorticoids. Because if you're not the, because again, if it's a hypothesis, the adrenals under the renin angiotensin system, so you still produce your mineralocorticoids. If you destroy your adrenal, you're not going to be able to produce either, so you'll need both. So do you stop therapy if you have these endocrine-related adverse effects? It depends on the case. If it's simple hypothyroidism, keep them on the therapy. That's, that's not an issue. If it's life-threatening thyroid storm, you probably want to hold it. Um, keep in mind, these, these folks have a life-threatening cancer. So we really, really try to keep them on their therapy, if at all possible. But again, if it's thyroid storm, we might need to take a break until they're doing better. Maybe they have their thyroidectomy, and then we resume therapy. Um, if you look at the American Society of Clinical Endocrinologists, they grade these adverse symptoms, grade one to four. Um, you can see it right there. The, the three and four are life-threatening, and that's when they pretty generally advise a guy's holding it, and the rest of it is kind of, there's some subjectivity to it. So um, as far as guidelines for screening for these, um, they, um, the same organization recommends checking your TSH and free T4 every four to six weeks when on therapy or if you're having new symptoms. If you're thyrotoxic, you should be checking them more frequently every two to three weeks to catch that transition to hypothyroidism. Um, screening for diabetes um, should be before each treatment, at least checking a glucose. Again, A1C is a little bit less useful, but just checking a serum glucose. Um, and then if they're doing well, uh, changing that to every three to six weeks afterwards. Adrenal insufficiency, they really recommend only screening for if they're clinically suspected of having it, though I know there's a lot of oncology groups that will check it before each cycle. I don't think that's wrong, um, but keep in mind there is a gray area for morning cortisol that requires some degree of interpretation. So summing it up, these, um, these immune checkpoint inhibitors are a really effective cancer treatment, but they lead to some side effects. Um, you want to monitor the thyroid and glucose labs before each cycle. You want to educate the patient on symptoms of endocrinopathies and be very aware of them. And consult your friendly endocrinologist early. We can often help out even if it's just giving you some advice about where to go. And the, the researchers are quite active. Apparently, they have a, a musical group to help educate people about this as well. So um, I thank everyone for your patience. And I guess we just open it up to questions. Dr. I'm seeing one question on the um... Would there ever be a reason to withhold the checkpoint inhibitor for DKA? Why not just give insulin and continue treatment? Yeah, generally, if, it, if it's DKA and we're managing them, I, I absolutely would continue the therapy. We're going to get them under control. Once the, um, once the islets are destroyed, they're going to be on insulin anyway. And there's nothing special that will make worse ketoacidosis with the ICIs. It's just initially destroying the beta cell. So I, in that case, I would probably would continue with the immune checkpoint inhibitors. Yeah. Any comment, Dr. Imran? Yeah, so immune therapy, uh, most of them are given every three weeks. Uh, there are some that are given every two. Now the frequency is expanding to every four weeks. So what happens practically is that the patient may get admitted with DKA. And fortunately, this is very uncommon. It's rare. And then um, they would improve and um, they would be discharged and they would not be due for their next dose in another two to four weeks, which gives enough time for recovery. And then really at that time, you're looking at their disease status. Many times these patients do not have any alternative treatment options. So if I have another chemotherapy regimen or any other medicine that I can give them, then we can consider that. But if we don't, then it's a serious discussion with the patient saying, we could either continue with immune therapy, especially if it's working for your malignancy, and then deal with the side effects, or we can just withhold it. So almost always the answer is that we continue the immune therapy. But if a second time another serious side effect happens, then we call it quits and we say, okay, the, the treatment is worse than the cancer. Fortunately, it's a relatively uncommon occurrence. So Dr. Leshio, there's one last uh, question for you on there. Uh, the 1.8 to 2.3% Change, the change in the positivity rate, uh, is that broadly distributed or Monroe County? And is it because the schools and the St. John Fish? Uh, it's presented in two ways. So the 1.7% is from the nine county area. The public health department has a, breaks it down in the county regions or health districts. That's, that is nine county area. But there's also a Monroe County area and the positivity rate in there is being driven to some extent by colleges, uh, not, not naming any, uh, but, but that's being seen across the country. Uh, some colleges are testing, they're trying to test their students before they send them home for the holidays. 
they're using various, uh, various approved and unapproved assays like saliva testing, and um, we're looking more into that. I think we're just about out of time. So thank you, everybody. Um, if people think we need another uh, update on COVID, either Dr. Lesho, if the ID department thinks that, or if there's a uh, demand for that from primary care or hospitalist physicians, please email me and we'll try to find, you know, either time in one of the grand round sessions or maybe even outside of that to, to address those. Um, Otherwise, uh, Grand Rounds will proceed uh, according to schedule and uh, see you next week. Take care.